Talk Show. Recorded live. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure and privilege and blessing to be here to talk about this. And before I even start, I want to thank you for the quote that you gave, a very poignant quote that has everything to do with the the information that we're about to cover. And that is a quote from an American Roman Catholic bishop in one of the mainstream, uh, most respected uh, newspapers in America. He said, and I quote, when the United States controls the world, the Roman Catholic Church will control the world. And the Roman Catholic Church controls the world. And if that sounds incredible, uh, what's even what would even seem more incredible is the fact that the Roman Catholic Church controls the United States of America. And of course Many of you are aware that <clears throat> myself and Walt Stickle and others that are in this research, a lot of people now, uh, it's growing by leaps and bounds, um, have talked about the Carroll family, the Roman Catholic Carroll family, the infinite wealth, infinitely wealthy and powerful Carroll family, that uh, one of which was a Jesuit, John Carroll, and the founder of the most powerful and prestigious university, Catholic, or rather Jesuit university in this country, uh, Georgetown University, which cultivates the cream of the intellectual crop in this country, Jesuitizes them, gives them Jesuit training, and then jobs them out to the, the most powerful political uh, offices in this country. And uh, it's literally a, 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 a farrowing house, if you will, for American politicians. And uh, that they, they occupy some of the most powerful offices in this country. And uh, America is going the way of Rome. It has gone the way of Rome ever since the founding of this country. And uh, nothing puts meat on those bones as does Pope, or rather Antichrist, Pope Benedict XVI's visit to this country in 2008. It took place in April and uh, of that year, along about the time of uh, Pope Benedict XVI's birthday. And But it was essentially called to order it, the purpose for the Pope's visit, among many, many, many other things of equal importance, it was officially uh, planned to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the first Roman Catholic bishopric, the first Roman Catholic bishopric of the colonial period, uh, the first bishop of, uh, of America, the first Roman Catholic bishop was the Jesuit priest, John Carroll, the founder of Georgetown University. And I will add something else that's very significant. This uh, bishopric, when it was established 200 years ago, as of April of 2008, was done during the period of the suppression of the Jesuits. They were no longer even supposed to exist in the world. Uh, The Jesuit order had been suppressed by a papal bull by the name of Dominic Ac Redemptor Noster. And it was a papal bull, some say, and not a brief. It had the official title of a bull, and that makes it Roman Catholic canon law, and that makes it irreformable. And uh, the papacy in uh, 1773 abolished the Jesuit order the, as, a, as a result of uh, universal outcry among the nations of Europe and the world for because of Jesuit intrigue, uh, the overthrow of governments, the official, ins- or the, the the uh, incessant 
instigation of wars, fomentation of wars and and uh, discord in Europe. The Catholic nations of, of Europe, along with even the Protestant nations of Europe, were... Uh, they knew what the purpose of the Jesuit order was, and the nations were tired of war, and uh, the papacy abolished the Jesuit order. And uh, I could go into a long dissertation now of what the Jesuits are, but the Jesuits are uh, simply a militia that acts globally to advance the papacy's power and control worldwide to create a global papal hegemony, a global papal government. That's their whole purpose for existence, global conquest for the Pope, to raise the papacy to global political and religious sovereignty, the king of kings and lord of lords. And that's their stated purpose. And they're sworn to a bloody oath to accomplish this for the papacy. And they are so intent in their purpose that if even the papacy begins to stand in their way of advancing the papal chair to global supremacy, they'll kill a pope. And they've killed many popes to achieve this. And uh, so every pope knows that he stands the risk, if he stands in the Jesuits' way, he stands the risk of being assassinated. But Pope Benedict XVI was uh, uh, very friendly to the Jesuit order. And uh, he came to this country to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the first Jesuit priest, uh, the first bishop uh, elevated to bishop in this country, the first official bishopric of this country who was a suppressed Jesuit at that time. So irony of ironies, Benedict XVI shows up to this this country. Now, if America were as we've always believed it was, a Protestant nation, immediately at at the time that that the Pope of Rome, Benedict XVI at that time, would have announced Uh, an official visit to this country, the Protestants of this country would have been outraged and would have protested against the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist setting his foot on Protestant shores. But at this time, there was very little Protestantism in this country. Having been converted to futurism, that that which says that the Antichrist doesn't come until the last seven years before Christ returns, and it's just a single man, rather than the historicist view that the papacy has always been the Antichrist of the Bible. And since the Protestants believed in a future Antichrist, they no longer protested the historical Antichrist, the papacy. You see, if you believe in a future single individual as being the Antichrist that comes just before Christ's return, that exonerates uh, the papacy throughout history that takes the onus away from the papacy, takes the onus of Antichrist away from the papacy throughout its history, and literally overturns the Protestant Reformation because the Protestant Reformation was built on the very foundation that the papacy is the Antichrist of the Bible. Every pope is the Antichrist. It's a dynasty. It's an office. Just like the presidency of the United States, it doesn't dissolve when a president dies. They just elect another one to put in the chair. So the office continues. And likewise, the papacy is an office that is filled with pope after pope after pope after pope. Each pope dies in turn, but the office continues. The, the establishment of the Antichrist in the world ha- has, has a history of over 1,800 years now. And this was the very foundation, the knowledge that rose up the Protestant Reformation. They protested the papacy. They called him the Antichrist 
of the Bible, of prophecy, and of history. And uh, so if one doesn't believe that the papacy throughout all its history is the Antichrist of Scripture, he cannot call himself a Protestant. So since there was no protest over Pope Benedict XVI uh, setting his foot on this shore, on American shores, then we can be certain that there was no Protestantism left in the country, having all been converted to futurism. All right, but... It doesn't, just because all so-called Protestants believe in a future Antichrist, it does not remove the onus of the papacy from from Antichrist because it is the Antichrist of the Bible. And this Pope Benedict XVI who came to this country uh, was just as much the Antichrist of history as was Pope Boniface VIII or the first pope or the current pope, Pope Francis I. Now, before we begin to cover Pope Benedict XVI's visit in 2008, I want the listeners to keep in mind that Pope Francis I, as a matter of fact, the first Jesuit pope, the first admitted Jesuit pope in world history, has announced plans to come to this country in the fall of next year. And I hope, it is my hope and prayer, that there has been enough Protestantism come back to this country that there will be a protest against the Antichrist once again desecrating Protestant soil and setting foot on our country. And to raise interest in Pope Francis I's visit next fall, I want to now reveal to the listeners what happened when Pope Benedict XVI came in 2008. Now, I was very in tune <clears throat> with suspicion, knowing who the Antichrist is. It's the papacy. When Pope Benedict XVI announced his, his intention to visit this country, I began to wonder what the Antichrist had up his sleeve for this Protestant land. And I began to research his itinerary, and I began to listen uh, with intent every day on uh, the satellite television to the Eternal Word Television Network. That's the official Roman Catholic channel. And to listen to EWTN's coverage of what Pope Benedict XVI had on his itinerary. Of course, there was talk about his birthday. There was talk about the 200th anniversary. Uh, there was much talk about the ecumenical movement uh, and, and many other things and, and how the Pope would be addressing all the religions of this country. And another researcher whose name some of you might be familiar with, John Daniel, the author of the book The Grand Design Exposed, uh, was also I- equally interested in this, and together we kind of made it a project to keep track of what this pope was intent to do, and then to pay particular attention during his visit and to see what he would do. Now we anticipated that Pope <clears throat> Pope Benedict the Sixteenth would literally take over this country, would announce himself as the king of this country under the under uh currently under the administration of of uh George W Bush who is a a a skull and bonesman which is just one of the auxiliary arms of the Jesuit order a freemasonic institution uh that serves the Jesuit general and knowing the history of the Bush families, and particularly Prescott Bush, uh, George W. Bush's grandfather, who financed Hitler's Nazi regime through his Union Banking Corporation, which fell under the disfavor of Congress, who eventually closed the bank for him, and should have uh, filed suit uh, against the Bush family for financing an, a, 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 an enemy of war, but which got away scot-free and simply uh, had to turn over the assets of their bank. But George W. Bush, who we knew 
had direct ties to the to Hitler's Nazi regime and being financers of that Hitler Nazi regime. And because of that financing, Hitler was able to wage a, a holy crusade, a holy Roman crusade against the Protestants of Germany, against the Jews of Germany and all of Europe, and uh, against the Orthodox uh, sect of the Catholic Church, which broke away from Rome in 1054 A.D. And so uh, it was uh, largely because of the Bush family that Hitler could afford to do uh, the Second World War. And uh, we knew that there was a very, very secret but very, very close relationship between the Bush family and the papacy. And we we wondered what what this could bode for the United States with a Bush in the White House having succeeded his father, George H.W. Bush, in the White House, and a Knight of Malta uh, in the White House, uh, Ronald Reagan, and also a Jesuit-trained Knight of Malta and 33rd degree Freemason, Bill Clinton, in the White House. You see, Rome has had a friend in the White House all throughout my life. And uh, knowing the, 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 import, the import of what Vatican Council II was in the 1960s, where the Protestant churches of this country denounced the Protestant Reformation and then sought to ecumenically reunite with the Roman Catholic Church and come back under the papacy's authority. We saw Pope Benedict XVI's visit to this country as the potential for an official announcement from the Pope in commensurate with the Bush family support in and commensurate with Vatican Council II and the ecumenical surrender of Protestantism, having refuted their Protestant Reformation, having believed in futurism and now exonerating the papacy and seeking to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope Benedict XVI had a platform, uh, a political, a political and a religious platform to justify standing before the American people and in some fashion or form claim himself to be the king of the United States of America and a ruler over the government of the country. And that's exactly what we found. It happened right before our very eyes. A few of us understood the significance of the things that took place in Washington, D.C. when Benedict XVI came to this country. But for the most part, since there is no more Protestantism in this country, or so little Protestantism that its voice cannot be heard anymore in the United States, the, 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 uh, the import uh, of, of, of all of Benedict's speeches, uh, all of the actions of, of President George W. Bush just flew right over the heads of the American people, and they did not comprehend what they were seeing right before their very eyes. And since this was such an important uh, uh, affair for me, I wrote a web page on it. And uh, if you want to go to my website, inquisitionupdate.org, on the right-hand side at the top, you'll find a link to my old web pages. And if you click on that, it'll take you to my old web pages. And you can scroll down on the left-hand side. You'll find a button that, talk, that says Vatican Takeover of America. And click on that, and you can bring this up. And I think Michael has probably posted a link to this web page uh, in, the, in the chat room so the listeners can go. Now, I've, 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 I'm looking at that page at the moment. And I will read the text that I wrote back in 2008 and see if you can understand what I was saying. And it includes videos backing up my assertions, 
you can click and watch all those videos and make your make make up your mind for yourself. But it, at the beginning of the page, it says April sixteenth, two thousand and eight, was celebrated as a military victory for the Pope over the United States of America. And I make notice that the Knights of Columbus, during the celebration on the White House lawn, were arrayed side by side with the U.S. Army. Now, before I go, I don't have to explain to the American people what the United States Army represents. It represents the military power of this country. But side by side with the U.S. Army was positioned the Knights of Columbus. And the Knights of Columbus are an oath-bound military in service to the Pope. So we literally have the representation of the papacy's global military, the Knights of Columbus, which are, which are just a wing of the Knights of Malta, a global military. And there they are st- sitting side by side, saluting and, and uh, literally worshiping the Pope, their commander-in-chief, with salutes. Now, you don't salute uh, 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 someone who is beneath you in rank, you salute the superior. That's what they're doing. Both the United States military and the the Vatican military, the Knights of Columbus in this country. And they're saluting their superior. Now, one might accuse me of being uh, a little rash in that description, and that they may have been saluting the President of the United States, who was on the same platform, George W. Bush. But this was all about Benedict XVI. It was not about George W. Bush. George W. Bush took a secondary role in that entire event. It was all focused to recognize Pope Benedict XVI. Now, before we even continue with this discussion, I want to remind the listeners that White House protocol requires that If a foreign head of state comes to the United States to visit with the president of this country, White House protocol demands that that foreign head of state, who is a guest in this country, must first meet the the leader of this country at the front door of the White House. That's U.S. White House protocol. It just stands to reason. Now, President Bush was going to go off to see uh, the leader of the Soviet Union, or Russia as we know it today. He would meet Vladimir Putin or whoever's in office at the time at the front door of his residence or the official residence of the president. And likewise, a foreign head of state, the papacy, which is the head of the, the state of Vatican City, came on a diplomatic mission to the United States, protocol dictates that he meet the president at the front door of the White House. He's a guest. And uh, this is just, it's almost universal protocol all over the world. This is the form of respect that is demonstrated all over the world. When you visit a foreign head of state, you meet him at his front door. But, in violation of official White House protocol, President George W. Bush got in his limousine and was chauffeured to Andrews Air Force Base, where a red carpet had been rolled out in front of the airplane at the foot of the steps of, demar- uh, uh, of in, uh, dis- disembarking at the airport and positioned on either side of that stairway from the airplane to the ground were U.S. military personnel dressed in full uniform. Now, U.S. military protocol forbids a uniformed officer of the United States Armed Forces to carry a foreign flag that can get you court-martialed. But yet, at, Air Force, at Edwards Air Force Base, at the foot of the stairs, coming down out of the airplane, was a full-dressed U.S. Marine carrying the Vatican flag. And 
Had there not been an exception made, he would be guilty of violation of official U.S. military protocol and hauled into court-martial. But there we have it, right in the videos. A Marine carrying the papal flag. Now notice in the video, when you watch, the red carpet that is laid out is rolled out so that the Pope doesn't get his feet dirty. And no one from the United States, no one, whether he be from the press, from the president's entourage, anyone from his family, anyone from the airlines, anyone from Edwards Air Force Base, no one was allowed to set foot on that red carpet until the Pope did. And so we observed the official protocol for, for visiting the Pope, and the Pope comes down the stairs and steps onto that red carpet, and then President and his, the President George W. Bush and his family join him on the carpet. Where we were a little bit amiss in our predictions of what would happen for that meeting, we expected Pope, John, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, as is customary protocol for the papacy, when he arrives on a foreign soil that he claims to own and rule, the papacy normally, after disembarking from the airplane, when his foot touches the, the ground, he immediately drops to his knees and kisses the ground, signifying that he owns it. This time, Pope Benedict XVI did not kiss the ground. And we stood a bit embarrassed because we predicted that he would, thus showing all uh, of the listeners uh, that he was going to demonstrate that he owns this country called Protestant. Okay? And I was a bit in a quandary when he didn't do it. And, of course, I was watching uh, the, 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 the full-time live coverage on EWTN at the time, and there was talk on, among the set of EWTN whether or not Pope Benedict XVI was going to kiss the ground when he arrived. And they were just as uh, uh, surprised as I was when Pope Benedict XVI didn't kiss the ground, and they asked the question, I wonder why the Pope didn't kiss the ground, which is customary. And somebody uh, from, you know, informed them that Benedict XVI did not kiss the ground because the uh, previous Pope, Pope John Paul II, in his papal visit to the United States, he did kiss the ground. And since the papacy is an office that that, that continues, Pope after Pope after Pope, the papacy is still the papacy, no matter who's in its office, who's in the chair, uh, that formality had already been completed. And so it was not, it was not uh, necessary for Benedict XVI to uh, kiss the ground. And uh, now, that's about all I have uh, uh, regarding the official first contact between the President of the United States and a head of a foreign state called the papacy, a most hostile foreign potentate to the Protestant United States of America, uh, where the President completely dismissed White House protocol, met the Pope at the airport rather than at the front door of the White House, allowing U.S. military forces to carry the Vatican flag against military protocol, and then uh, stepping aside and uh, leaving the the, uh, the, uh, the red carpet untouched until the Pope uh, until the Pope stepped on that red carpet, and then they uh, escorted him uh, to his entourage waiting for him at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. From there, uh, the party moved to the front lawn of the White House, and this is where I expected the worst to occur. And of course it did. And, but it was, it, was, it was all over the heads of the American people because they're not Protestant in their belief. They don't see the papacy as Antichrist. They don't see the papacy as what the papacy has always claimed to be, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. 
the governor of all governors, the head of the world. But Pope Benedict XVI came to this country, and you know, at state visits like this, everything is orchestrated. Everything is thoroughly uh, orchestrated and planned right down to the nth degree. Nothing happens that isn't programmed to happen. And that these state official state visits are full of symbology. That if we don't understand the symbols, we can't interpret what's really happening. And that was the case with the American people. But I described to you the two militaries, the United States military and the papal military, sitting, uh, standing side by side at attention and saluting the Pope, which has all kinds of, of, of significance for those who are protestant in their understanding and belief and have some knowledge of papal history and what role the papacy plays in the world and what role the Knights of Columbus play in the world and what role the, the, uh, the president plays uh, on the same stage with the Pope. Part, another thing that happened was, of course, the acknowledgement of the 200th anniversary of the first Roman Catholic bishopric in this country, a recognition of John uh, Carroll, the Jesuit priest. But that wasn't all. What the United States government allowed was the serenading of the Pope of Rome with the fife and drum corps. Now, those who are not aware of history will find this interesting. The fife and drum corps is significant or signifies the Revolutionary War. Now, the Revolutionary War, contrary to what you've been taught in your schools, the Revolutionary War was fomented to separate the United, the United Colonies, uh, the 13 colonies of what later became known as the United States, to separate those colonies from Protestant Great Britain. You see, prior to the Revolutionary War, the colonies were Protestant. And... Uh, 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 escapes me, the word escapes me right now. Uh, but Roman Catholicism, prior to the revolution, prior to the Revolutionary War, Protestantism forbid the practice of Roman Catholicism because they were aware of Roman Catholic and Vatican and Jesuit intrigues in Protestant England. They tried to blow up uh, Parliament. They, pri they tried to blow up King James I and all of the parliament, which represented the people. It, they, they launched the Spanish Armada against the Protestant Queen of England. Over and over and over, the Vatican tried to take back Protestant England and make it officially Roman Catholic again, to make England Roman Catholic. And the Protestants continually fought off uh, the papal attempts to regain Great Britain and put it back under the authority of the papacy and make the Pope king of England and to put a Roman Catholic on the throne of England to, ru to rule in the Pope's stead. The, the, the Protestants of, of the, the, uh, the colonies were aware of that history. And they were constantly vigilant to suppress Roman Catholicism in this country. And so the Mass was illegal. The celebration of the Mass could not be done anywhere, much less in public. And uh, if there were Roman Catholics to, uh, coming to this country, they had to keep their Catholicism hidden for fear of raising up the 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 uh, ire, if you'll permit me, to raise up the ire of Protestants, and uh, uh, but the Revolutionary War was fomented 
by the Jesuits and by Freemasons, both in England and and the colonies, so as to separate the colonies from the government of Great Britain, the Protestant government of Great Britain. And it was accomplished. And, of course, it's never taught to us what the real purpose of the Revolutionary War was. I mean, we're all taught that it was, it was about tea and taxes. Well, the controversy over tea and taxes was simply a way to achieve a, a, a Roman Catholic victory over the colonies and to make religious liberty the standard for the new colonial period after the, res- after the revolution and make Roman Catholicism on equal footing with Protestantism, declaring religious liberty. And, of course, that gave, that gave the Freemasons, the Luciferians of Freemasonry, to practice their religion, too, openly. And so all things considered, it was a net gain for paganism. It was a net gain for Roman Catholicism, and it was a total defeat of Protestantism. And so, who was the the official winner? Secret though it was, who was the official winner of the Revolutionary War? It was the papacy. The Revolutionary War was a religious war against Protestantism, and the Pope won. And this visit of Pope Benedict XVI was an open acknowledgement from our government demonstrating who it was that won the Revolutionary War. And again, we have U.S. military and papal military, the Knights of Columbus, standing at attention and saluting Benedict XVI. Then we have the Fife and Drum Corps, which represents nothing but the Revolutionary War, serenading the Pope. And we have singers singing, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Who were they singing to? The Pope. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They were singing to the Pope. U.S. military and Knights of Columbus singing to the Pope, Thy kingdom come. The Fife and Drum Corps of the Revolutionary War serenading the victor of that war. And then... To cap it all off, and I, by, by the way, I haven't, I haven't covered everything that happened that day. I don't want to belabor the point. But to cap it all off, they, they honored the Pope with a 21-gun cannon salute. And there's a link on this page. You can click and see that, gun, that 21-gun cannon salute. Right there on the front, uh, right there on the White House lawn. Now let me go to Wikipedia right now, and and read what Wikipedia says about a 21 gun salute. Okay, gun salutes, according to Wikipedia, under 21 gun salute, it says this: gun salutes are the firing of cannons or firearms as a military honor. That's what it says right on Wikipedia. It's consistent with everything that I've said. They gave a 21-gun salute to the Pope. And 21-gun salutes are the firing of cannons or firearms as a military honor. So here we have the significance that is demonstrated through everything that happened that day, that it was to honor a military victor in the Revolutionary War. Now, it wasn't Protestants or pilgrims that were being honored that day. It was the Pope of Rome, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist of the Bible. 
They were our government was announcing the Pope to be the military victor of the Revolutionary War. Now, let me read further on Wikipedia regarding the 21 gun salute. It says the custom stems from naval tradition where a warship would fire its cannons harmlessly out at sea until all ammunition was spent to show that it was disarmed, signifying the lack of hostile intent. So what a 21-gun customary, uh, 21-gun salute customarily and historically represents is a surrender. In the Navy, when a ship was overtaken by an enemy force, instead of engaging in war, it would fire all of its ammunition, thus disarming itself as a demonstration of harmlessness and surrender. Now, you may see a 21-gun salute in totally different context, as I did before I read this Wikipedia page. But we're not talking about the social implications of a 21-gun salute. We're not talking about the coloring that has taken place over the years with the 21 gun salute. We're talking about the historical custom, the historically uh, significant significance of the, the historic military custom of a 21 gun salute. It's the firing off or discharging of all of its weapons as a means to disarm. It's typical of the laying down of arms. It's typical of surrender. And that's the meaning that it had during the celebration of Pope Benedict XVI, the papacy, at the time of the Revolutionary War. Now you can read this Wikipedia page all you all to you, you know, all by yourself. And if you can come up with a different conclusion than I have. Uh, you, you can email me at tom at seawaves.us, and you can tell me whether or not I've overstated this. But it's consistent with what we suspected the papacy was up to when it announced its visit to this country. It's consistent with the actions and words of President George W. Bush, and it's consistent with everything else that Pope Benedict XVI said and did during his visit. And now since the Revolutionary War was a victory of the papacy over a Protestant land where the mass was forbidden, the practice of Roman Catholicism was forbidden, what did the papacy then do? On the 20th of April, four days after his arrival to this country, in Yankee Stadium... That's significant. Yankee Stadium, who were the Yanks? The revolutionists, right? The ones that the papacy defeated at the Revolutionary War? At Yankee Stadium on the 20th of April, Adolf Hitler's birthday, remember the connection between the Bush family and the Nazi regime of Adolf Hitler? And how the Bush family financed the Hitler regime? And I'll add also, did not the, the, the former Pope Pius XI sign a concordat in 1933 with Hitler before the war? And the, 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 the then Pope, uh, Pope Pius XII, who led that inquisition through Nazi Germany, through Adolf Hitler and the, and the SS against the Protestants and the Jews and the Orthodox. Is this not being acknowledged by the Pope's strategic pick of, 
of Nazi Germany's Adolf Hitler's birthday, the 20th of April, to do what was never lawful to do in this country prior to the Revolutionary War, but to offer an an outdoor mass to the Catholics of New York City. They sacrificed Christ afresh on that altar on Hitler's birthday in front of the cameras of a once Protestant land where the mass was illegal prior to the Revolutionary War. It's, it was exactly what John Daniel and I predicted it would be. It was dripping in historical significance. And every historical event that it uh, celebrated was proclaimed by the actions and events that occurred on the White House lawn as celebrating the papacy as the victor of the Revolutionary War. And I want to remind the listeners that this same Carroll family that produced the Jesuit priest that became the first bishopric in the United States of America, that same Carroll family donated all the land that is now occupied by the the, uh, Capitol building in Washington, D.C. And also, much of what is known today as Washington, D.C. was owned by the Carroll family and donated for the federal seat of the United States government. And our history books didn't tell us a word about any of this. The press didn't tell us what the significance were of the events that occurred on the 16th uh, through the end of Benedict XVI's visit. And that's not all that happened. Pope Benedict XVI met with the Protestant leaders of this land. The leaders of every Protestant denomination in this country met with Pope Benedict XVI at one of the Roman Catholic cathedrals, and each were called by name. They came forward one at a time and shook the hand of the Pope. many of them wearing black. According to Roman Catholic canon law, which signifies their submission, their subordination and penance. Submission. And all of that is consistent with what was decided at Vatican Council II in the 1960s. where Protestants renounced their Protestantism, declared publicly that it was an error to say that the papacy is the Antichrist of the Bible because they believe in a future Antichrist now, a single individual. That had been taught in the churches in this country ever since the early 1800s, and it had finally reached all the Protestant churches. Futurism has become the orthodox teaching of the Protestant churches today. They no longer look at the papacy as the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist. They have renounced Protestantism. And while you're on that Wikipedia page, I implore you to just type in the words Protestantism and read what it says. Protestantism is built on the belief that the papacy is the antichrist of the Bible. That's the definition of Protestantism. Not only does it embrace Christ as the Savior of the world, the the remission of our sins, the propitiation of our sins, and union with the Father, but it denounces the papacy as the Antichrist or the counterfeit Christ in the world. That's what it says on Wikipedia about Protestantism, and that's exactly what it means. So if you call yourself a Protestant and you do not believe the papacy is the Antichrist of the Bible, the historic papacy, 
from the beginning to the current is, was, and always will be the, the Antichrist of the Bible, you cannot legitimately call yourself a Protestant. If you believe that, the, that there is a future Antichrist, thus exonerating the entire history of the papacy, then you have repudiated Protestantism. And that's exactly what futurism was designed to do, to get the Protestants to, to refute their own beliefs. And once that was accomplished, then all Rome had to do was say, we forgive you, come back to mama. And that's what they're doing. That's what they've done in this country. There's almost no Protestantism left in this country. And that's why the, the historical and significant events that happened on the White House lawn during Pope Benedict XVI's visit simply escaped all understanding in this country, except for the Roman Catholic hierarchy and the hierarchy of the American government. Together, they celebrated their new union, official union of church and state on the White House lawn. There being no more Protestantism to protest it. They demonstrated before the world's cameras a union of church and state. The Pope, beside his king, or beside the king of the United States, George W. Bush, together united. And who did they celebrate? Benedict the Sixteenth. And that celebration focused on the Revolutionary War, where Protestantism was officially defeated in this country, and Roman Catholicism was given liberty to not only practice Roman Catholicism, but to grow in strength and power, and in a little over 250 years to control this country. What occurred on the White House lawn, and every other thing that occurred during the Pope's visit, was dripping with the significance that the papacy was the king of kings and lord of lords of the United States of America. Now, having touched the high parts, just the high points of that visit, which you can go to this website and you can see the pictures, you can watch the videos, particularly read the captions, uh, that are printed on these on these videos. When you see, here's one right at the middle of my page. Pope Benedict XVI standing at the microphones in front of the White House, or yes, in front of the White House, and part of what he says is, and strengthen the resolve of Catholics to contribute ever more responsibly to the life of this nation. The Antichrist of the Bible, the papacy, was standing before the cameras and the microphones of this country admonishing Roman Catholics, not Protestants, not Christians, but Roman Catholics, to contribute ever more responsibly to the life of this nation. And in words of interpretation, what that means is admonishing every Roman Catholic to gain high office, aspire to the highest offices of this land, to use their occupations and their avocations to help elevate the papacy to power and strength in this country. After all, they had just proclaimed the United States to be a Roman Catholic country, did they not? The significance of all that happened on the White House lawn, the significance of everything that happened that entire week of his visit was to acknowledge the papacy as the king and to make everyone else subservient, including the President of the United States and all its people. And the Pope had the brazen audacity to serve mass in public, and he also called Roman Catholics to seek the most responsible positions in the life of this country. And that's why you'll find the most powerful politicians in this country are Roman Catholic, 
On the Supreme Court, there is not, for the first time in the history of this country, there is not one Protestant on the, on, on the Supreme Court. Not one Protestant. There are six Roman Catholics. And not just Roman Catholics, they belong to Roman Catholic militias, like the, the uh, 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 Opus Dei. And the rest are Jews, also subservient to the papacy. Those Jews know, those Jews who are sitting on that court know who killed the six million Jews in Germany. It wasn't Hitler. It was Pope Pius XII. It was Pope Pius XII. They know who their king is. But don't don't miss the point. There's not one Protestant on the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's job is to interpret the Constitution and the Bill of Rights of the United States. They're the ones who interpret the law. We have Roman Catholics interpreting our law with a Roman Catholic bent, with a Roman Catholic prejudice with a Roman Catholic mission. Are you losing your rights? Are you losing your liberty? Are you losing your right to criticize both the Pope and the King? Do you realize that's what the Protestant Reformation gave us, the right to criticize both the Pope and the King? And do you know why the Protestants criticized the Pope and the King? Because they were united. The Pope controlled all the kings of Europe. And the Pope demanded that the king exterminate the heretics from out of his realms. And who are the heretics? The Protestants and the Bible believers. Those who would never bend the knee to the Pope. There are your inquisitions, led by government authorities in every land to seek out Protestants, heretics, and to try them in the inquisition and burn them at the stake. no Protestants on the Supreme Court interpreting our Constitution and Bill of Rights. And we're losing our rights, aren't we? And the king of this country, George W. Bush at that time, now Barack Obama, who's just as subservient to the papacy as is as was George W. Bush, sitting there with a serpent's grin on his face while the Pope tells us right before the cameras that he wants Catholics to run this country. Now, if I haven't done anything else tonight, I hope I have raised some Protestant blood. And I hope with that new Protestant fervor, the listeners of this program will take the examples that I've just given you over Pope, or rather Antichrist Pope Benedict XVI's visit in 2008, to watch just as carefully, no, yea, even more carefully, to Pope Francis I's visit to the United States this fall. Watch it with a biblical eye. Watch it with a prophetic eye. Watch it with an historical eye, and mostly watch it with a Protestant eye. Watch it carefully. And you'll get the best information, believe it or not, from EWTN, the Eternal Word television network, the official Roman Catholic channel, because it's their king that's coming to this country. And they know more about the significance of what this pope is going to do and say than anybody else in this country, including the Protestants. And they're not bashful about telling you what the pope is doing in this country. And you can also stay tuned to Inquisition Update, because you can bet I'm going to be watching it with my eyes wide open. 
Inquisition update is heard Monday through Friday at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. You can email me at Tom at SeaWaves.us. That's Tom at S-E-A-W-A-V-E-S dot U-S. And that's all I have for this evening. I'll send it back to Michael. Thanks for having me. Economically? Yeah. What do I mean? Well, well sure. It, it goes hand in hand with what Benedict the Sixteenth did in 2008. First of all, I want to give the, the American people, whoever's listening tonight, the rest of the story. You know, there's much talk about the Federal Reserve. Most people who know what the Federal Reserve is, that it's not an American bank. It's a foreign bank. And they know it's run by the Rothschilds. But what they don't know about the Rothschilds are, uh, is that the Rothschilds are listed in the, in, in the uh, Jewish Encyclopedia. You can look it up yourself in the Jewish Encyclopedia. It's online. You look it up yourself and go to Rothschilds and read what it says about the Rothschilds. And one place it says... The Rothschilds are the guardians of the papal treasure. The Rothschilds were French Jews. They originally, their their name, their real name is Bauer. They're Jews, and they're also Freemasons. And we know Freemasonry is just a, a, a wing of the Jesuit order, one of those multiplying agencies that the Jesuits rely upon to do their bidding in the world. They are Jewish Freemasons, and they were trained at the Louis, uh, Lycée Louis Le Grand, a French Jesuit university, and that's where they got their, uh, their training in economics and money lending. And what they use for their currency is the papal treasure, and they own the banks. The Federal Reserve Bank is a Jesuit bank. The Rothschilds work for the Jesuits. The patrimony of Peter, the wealth of the Roman Catholic Church, is owned and controlled by the Jesuit order. And the Jesuit surrogates, in this case, are the Rothschilds. Now, what they do is they print money, lend it to the American government, and then charge interest on it. And we're indebted to the tune, many people say, uh, 10 trillion, 19 trillion, I've heard as high as 29 trillion dollars, a debt we'll never be able to pay. As a matter of fact, in co- taking in collateral for that debt, the Vatican has consumed all the United States gold. And that's literally what happened on 9-11. But one of the things that happened on 9-11 was they confiscated all the gold that was located there. And uh, we know that uh, uh, Thomas Thomas Gambino uh, of the the, uh, mafia crime family uh, did an interview uh, years ago on Greg Zizmanski, an investigative journal, and he admitted that his grandfather... Uh, was one of the major contractors on the Twin Towers. And that in the columns, the heavy concrete, re- a steel, con- a steel reinforced concrete pillars in the basement uh, was a void which contained much of the United States gold. And it was those pillars that were attempted to be blown away in 93 at the first World Trade Center event and which were blown away uh, prior, just prior to the plane striking uh, the tower on 9-11, and there were eyewitnesses to big, heavy trucks that were loading the gold and taking it out of the World Trade Center uh, after that initial bombing. And so the Vatican, ha- the, the, the Vatican, through the Federal Reserve Bank, has taken collateral on this phony debt that is owed in real hard gold. And having now in its possession all the nation's gold, in addition to that, uh, they've taken the land. And you can see on on the maps describing these national heritage sites or these international heritage sites, uh, virtually all the land uh, west of the Mississippi is now claimed 
as collateral on the debt. And not only does the Vatican own the gold and the land, it owns many of the people, too. And that's why we have no sovereignty. We have no rights anymore. There's not enough. It's, it's obvious to everyone now. It's obvious to the whole world that the United States can never pay its debt. It doesn't have enough assets. All of its assets are tied up as collateral against that debt and then sold to places like China and Russia. And many Muslim nations own a portion of that debt. And so when the Vatican is ready to pull the plug on this uh, once Protestant republic, she could easily call in she could easily call in China or Russia or both together with the Muslim nations to claim what's left. And uh, I know this is above the heads of most who are listening, but history is going to prove that the Vatican, listen, can you comprehend this? That every dime the taxpayers pay that is collected by the the, the the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, goes to the Jesuits. And if you want someone with more authority and, and more prestige, more recognition than Tom Press, simply go to Google Videos or, or YouTube or whatever it's called and type in the, the name uh, Karen Hudis, K-A-R-E-N, Karen Hudes, H-U-D-E-S, H-U-D-E-S, Karen Hudes, and listen to her interviews. She's a whistleblower at the World Bank. She was uh, one of the chief legal counsels. She led the legal team that regulated, that gave internal regulation to the World Bank. She was one of the most powerful people at the World Bank. And she is now saying publicly in every interview that she can possibly do, and it, she's telling us that 60%, a full 60% of every dollar that's paid in taxes to the Internal Revenue Service goes directly to the Jesuit order. And this is known globally. She's had, she's had direct communications with the government, the governors of the states of the United States, informing the governors of the United States, the states of the United States, that this is a hostile Vatican takeover of the, of the country. It, it's on record from someone infinitely more powerful and knowledgeable than Tom Press, who has, who was a late. She was a late comer to this, but she's a quick study. And she found corruption at the World Bank, and she traced that corruption and its cover-up, and she came to some very concrete conclusions. And they all involved the Jesuit order and the Roman Catholic Church. She'll tell you flat out that the Federal Reserve Bank is owned by the Jesuits. Yes, the Rothschilds run it, but they are the guardians of the papal treasure. Now, my credibility as just a little Iowa country bumpkin uh, pales in comparison to somebody like Karen Mutis. And it's easy to dismiss somebody like me as a kook. But you can't dismiss Karen Hudis. And I invite all your listeners to Google Karen Hudis. Go to her website. Read her material. Go to YouTube. Watch her videos. And see it for yourself. The United States is in a crisis. Protestantism is under attack. We have been financially enslaved by the Vatican through the Federal Reserve Bank, a Jesuit bank. And Rome's ready to call in her chips. And the only thing that can stave off this Vatican uh, destruction of this Protestant land is to return to Christ and return to Protestantism, the knowledge and the belief, the conviction 
that the papacy, and only the papacy, is the Antichrist of the Bible, the Antichrist of history, and the Antichrist of prophecy. The little horn, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of the Bible are speaking of one and the same system, the papacy. Daniel prophesied it. Paul prophesied it. The apostle John and 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 prophet prophesied it. We've seen it through history. We've seen it through war. We've seen it through politics. We've seen it through world economics. We've seen it through the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. And now we're going to add our blood to theirs if we do not act. Back to you, Michael. Thank you, Tom. Well, I got a question for you because I was going to ask you, what can we do about this? And you said return to Christ. Return to Protestantism. Spread Protestantism. The knowledge that the papacy is the Antichrist and the papacy has taken over this country. Now, look. The Protestant reformers didn't have to raise a gun. They didn't have to raise a sword. They simply informed all the Christian world and showed them from the Scriptures and from history that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, and they liberated all of Europe. Yes, there was war, but they had to overthrow their own governments, too, because their governments were subservient to the papacy. And they overthrew those governments, and they put representative governments where the people ruled the government, not the Pope. And that's what we have to do in this country. We know our government has turned into a hierarchical system that doesn't care at all about the people or its rights. It doesn't care about true Bible Christianity. It wants to destroy true Bible Christianity because it serves the papacy. And the papacy knows there's only one power on earth that ever threatened the extermination of Rome, uh, of of, of the papacy. And that was the simple knowledge taught by the Protestant reformers that the papacy is the Antichrist of the Bible. And, and, and we, we, we need another Protestant Reformation, and it cannot happen unless there comes a majority view in this country that the papacy is the Antichrist. You see, because we have exonerated the Antichrist with our futurist beliefs, we have offended our Savior. We cannot serve two masters. And now in this ecumenical movement, that's what we're doing. We claim Christ with our mouth, but we obey the papacy and the civil government that imposes his canon law upon us and, and excludes God's holy, eternal, and perfect law of liberty. You see, by exonerating the papacy, we have we have dishonored every drop of Protestant blood that the papacy has shed throughout history to the tune of hundreds of millions of souls. By exonerating the papacy, we have desecrated the names and the teachings of the Protestant reformers. We have renounced Protestantism by joining this ecumenical movement to unite God's house with the synagogue of Satan in Rome. And God is not going to have it. And we must repent. Serve Christ and cast out Antichrist. That's where we stand. We've committed the same sin of Israel where they wanted to claim God as their king, but they worshiped according to Baal, raising obelisks and 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 idols and images and pagan celebrations, pagan rituals, God would not have it. He would not have his name mixed with the name of Baal. 
he would not have his holy service on Mount Moriah mixed with the traditions and ceremonies of Baal worship. And when we repudiated the Protestant Reformation and then sought to ecumenically reunite with the Roman Catholic Church, we committed the same error. Now, Israel, for her abominations, were sent to Assyrian captivity. Judah, who committed these same offenses, were sent to Babylonian captivity. We're not going to be sent anywhere. Rome has come to us. And we've invited her with both open arms. And God is not going to have it. So, you know, we're looking at this uh, financial crisis that started in 2007 and then really started ramping up in 2008. And we are still in it, especially with the housing bubble and the crash and the tens of millions of folks who have lost their homes. A housing bubble that could not have been possible were it not for the Jesuit-trained Bill Clinton. Oh, boy. Let's talk about that a little bit. You're right. He's Knights of Malta, trained with the Georgetown under Quigley. What happened? It's an attack on Protestantism. It's cloaked in economics. It's cloaked in health care. It's cloaked in war. It's cloaked under the Federal Reserve. It's cloaked under Congress. It's cloaked under the, 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 the White House. It's cloaked under the Supreme Court. But it's always an attack on Protestantism. Protestantism is the ultimate target for this Roman beast that now controls our government and has at least since Roosevelt. So what I see is, Tom, I see, I look back in history, I look at Germany in the 20s and 30s, and I see it being replayed again in this country. You know, as part of uh, the, the Jesuits and Rome's end game for this country is to bring us down to such a point that we're willing to do go all out on this ridiculous World War Three, or is it just you know what is what's the end game here why why are they destroying us well I said that at the outset of the program what is desired by the papacy what has historically been the goal of the papacy ever since its beginning is to claim the world as his inheritance. Under the donation of Constantine, a, a, a known forgery, the Vatican has claimed to be the owner of the, of, of the land, the air, and the sea. The donation of Constantine, just look it up on Wikipedia and read about it yourself to know what it is. The, the, the basis for the global empire of the papacy is the donation of Constantine and the false decretals. You can Google that title too and read it yourself. The false decretals. The donation of Constantine, false decretals, and also uh, the claim, the false claim, that Peter, the apostle, was the first pope of the Roman Catholic Church. And together these things give the papacy what it believes to be sole sovereign right over heaven and earth and hell. That's why the papacy wears a triple crown called the tiara. That's what tiara means, triple crown. And on that bullet-shaped crown that's infinitely expensive and crusted with some of the most precious jewels in the world, and the Pope has hundreds of them, there are three crowns, one at the top, one in the middle, and one down about just above the brow. And they each represent the realm of the Pope. The top one represents his authority over heaven, and the middle one represents his his authority over the earth, and the bottom one represents his authority over hell. And that's why the papacy claims the keys The keys of Janus, you can look that up too and find out what they are. Two keys, 
the authority over heaven and the earth, okay, spiritual and temporal. That gives the authority of the papacy to open and shut the king, the, 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 the doors of heaven and to control the governments of the world, temporal and spiritual. The papacy has always claimed this. This isn't new. I didn't make this up. This is embodied in Roman Catholic canon law. This is embodied in the councils, all of the councils held by the papacy throughout the centuries. It's been reiterated in every council, even Vatican Council II. And so what we're seeing the United States government doing is just helping this come to fruition, full global fruition. That's the significance of what happened on the White House lawn in 2008. Our government demonstrating by its actions publicly in front of the cameras and microphones its recognition as the its recognition of the papacy as the victor of the revolutionary war this establishes the the papacy as the king of the king of this country the king of the government and it's not just the united states it's all the governments of the world literally what we are seeing taking place before our very eyes is the 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 reestablishment of the old world order the old world order was called the middle ages or the dark ages and it was dark because the papacy ruled the roost the papacy picked all the kings of europe every government was a papal government okay this isn't new in the world the idea that the Pope got rules the governments of the world. This isn't a new idea. It's as old as the Roman Catholic Church itself. And the, the, they call it the New World Order is simply because the Old World Order was destroyed by the Protestant Reformation. So if the Old World Order was destroyed by the Protestant Reformation, we have a recipe in our cupboard of how to destroy the new world order. Simply proclaim the papacy as the Antichrist of the Bible. And to hold to Christ and his law, proclaim his kingdom, and reject the papacies. And without that authority, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the governments of the world will reject his leadership. You see, they think he's the vicar of Christ, the representative of Christ on earth. That's what the papacy claims to be. And that's why they give all their power and their strength to him. That's what was demonstrated on the White House lawn in 2008. The United States government was giving their power and strength and recognition to the papacy. That's why he traipsed all over uh, New York and Boston and Washington, D.C., desecrating everywhere he went, and even so much as bringing into servitude the leaders of all the Protestant churches. And there wasn't a whimper of protest anywhere. The old world order, or the new world order, is simply the old world order restored. The old one was destroyed by the Protestant Reformation and the French Revolution. A, a one-two punch. It was all directed against the papacy. Both the Protestant Reformation and the French Revolution, which was atheist in character, they leveled a one-two punch against the papacy. And the papacy lost his temporal power. He could no longer control the governments of the world. He could no longer lead the nations in crusades against God's people. And the papacy, since the Lateran Accords were signed by uh, the papacy and uh, Mussolini in 19, February 11th, 1929, the papacy has literally rebuilt the old world order. And our government official, George H.W. Bush, I'd call him president, but he wasn't elected by the people. He was a papal king. 
in his in his State of the Union address, he announced this new world order. He just failed to tell us what it was. He knew who he was speaking to, and he knew they would understand what this new world order is. It's only the Protestants who are ignorant. Well, I would argue this more than just the Protestants. I would think it's 99% of this country is, regardless of whether you're Protestant or you're a heathen or you're atheist or whatever you want to be labeled or what people label you. The fact is this country has been de- deceived from the get-go. And in, once again, what happened in 2000, you know, April 16th through the 20th of 2008, only a handful of people knew about it. You're one of them. I didn't hear about this at all until last night. This message is extremely important. For those who join in late, go back and listen to this whole episode. It will be one of the most important episodes you will ever hear in your life. And it's not an exaggeration. For those who are listening to this and who will be listening to this, I beg you, to download this and pass this on to as many people as you can. The only answer we have left at this point, folks, is to expose the Antichrist, regardless of how tired people are about it, regardless of how they don't care about it. You know what? We have to. It's our last hope. We lost the Protestant movement in this country. It was finalized during Reagan's period and and his inauguration in the 80s. And then in 2008, we lost our, go- we lost our government completely. And if we're fooling ourselves if we think there's any more options left at this point outside of God Almighty himself and the fact that we finally wake up and we start having enough courage to speak the truth for once or there will be no change at all for the positive. There will be none. And at this point forward, there's going to be nothing but pain. There's going to be nothing but sorrow. And if we don't stand up and at least expose who's responsible for this, we are, I tell you, we're, I don't know what God's going to think of us. You mentioned pain (laughs) and sorrow. You mentioned pain and sorrow, Mike. I call it inquisition. Yeah, you're right. We're, 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 whatever happened, what happened every time the papacy got control of a government? You know, the, the, the Holy Roman Empire wasn't built in a day. It was built nation by nation by nation. And every time the Vatican got control of a government, every time the papacy made that government Roman Catholic, the first order from the papacy was to the new Roman Catholic king of that land, exterminate the heretics from your realms. And that's what they did. And we can't expect anything less. And that's why my program is called Inquisition Update, because Rome now controls our government. And has for a long time. And the only reason there haven't been the beheadings of Bible-believing Protestants, the only reason we haven't been burned burned at the stake or laid in the guillotines, is because we've surrendered to the ecumenical movement. Now, should we continue this peaceable surrender to the Vatican through Vatican Council II and ecumenism? Or should we return to Christ before it's too late? We better return to Christ. That's right. There is no other option. We've got no choice. We have to repent like Daniel did in Daniel chapter 9. Read Daniel chapter 9, the the first 23 verses. Daniel was weeping in sorrow for not only his sins, but the sins of Israel, for bowing down to images and idols, for worshiping God by the means that the pagans worshiped Baal, the Babylonian god, the sun god, Daniel finally understood the sin of Israel. And he knew by reading the books of the Bible that they would be in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. 
and we're in Babylonian captivity now, but nobody's even re- repenting. We owe the same prayer to Christ today that Daniel owed to God when he prayed in Daniel chapter 9. I agree. Read read the first 23 verses of Daniel chapter 9 and know in your heart that should be your prayer to God on your face in sackcloth and ashes. If you have believed in this future phony Jesuit deception and have exonerated the papacy and no longer view the papacy as the Antichrist and welcome Pope Benedict XVI or Francis I this fall, you owe God that repentance, the same repentance that Daniel uttered in chapter 9. We all do. We have grievously erred. We have grievously offended our God. And we deserve this Babylonian captivity that we're in. And there's only one thing that's going to stop the full fruition of this Babylonian complete control of our country and subjugation of God's heritage, the saints of Almighty God, is to repent of ecumenism. Repent of our idolatry. We cannot worship the Pope. He's a mere man and likely a pedophile at that. And the current pope is a Jesuit priest. It's, a, it's an army of pedophiles. God has made it easy for us to condemn what has now become the king of this world. It's known all over the world that there's an epidemic, a global pandemic of Roman Catholic pedophile priests. You would think that alone would wake us up Never mind the fact that the, the Federal Reserve Bank is a Jesuit bank, that the chaplain in the, in the Congress is a Jesuit priest, that the advisor of Barack Obama when he was nobody in Chicago was a Jesuit priest by the name of Gregory Galuzzo, that the Supreme Court is, is a supermajority Roman Catholic vote and not one single Protestant among them. That's what that's the, uh, the the state of apostasy that Israel was in before Babylon just came and took them all captive and made them bow down to worship images and idols. And I'll tell you, that's just exactly what our government's going to do. It's going to make us on pain of of economic sanction to bow down and worship this idol, the papacy the Antichrist of the Bible, to bow down and worship images and idols, just like Israel did. And to send our children off to crusades, wars, That's what papal they're done. wars. That's what they're, they're done. crushing us financially to make us fight these wars in the final, the final phase of these wars. And we, you know, it's... If we really are truly Bible-believing Christians, first of all, it is our responsibility to be annoying about who the Antichrist is and let everybody know. And it's our responsibility, for anybody who's been sitting here listening to the show or in the future, to download the show, not to promote nothing but the truth, because I could give a, a rat's derriere about the whole thing about me. This message is so important. Yeah, we're not selling anything. This we're, is, we're not trying to become rich and famous. You can forget my name right after this show. Just don't forget the information you got here. And I, this, I mean, anybody who listens to that, this show tonight, will, you have to come away with a realization of what has happened to you, to this country, and what your future and your children's future is. And if you don't speak up and do something about it, if you just go, ha, ha, well, this is just an intellectual endeavor, and now I know more about the Vatican, or I know more about the papacy, or I know more about Roman Catholicism, you have missed the whole point. This is not an intellectual endeavor. This is not about you proving yourself that you got it all figured out. This is it. You listen to this show doesn't matter who it is, now or in the future. 
You now have a responsibility that you cannot shirk. You can't use imagination, futurism. You can't use all this ridiculous arguments about who the Antichrist is. There's no more excuses. And there's no more excuses if you don't bring this up to people. You don't bring up what happened in 2008. If you don't bring up the fact of what this country really is about. And I tell you, I think of all of these different quote-unquote Christian leaders, leaders out there it's sharing all this ridiculous false information just to make a buck I mean, half of them actually believe in it because they're too dang lazy to actually do any homework. They're too lazy to even be inspired by God. They don't even believe in God. They just want a paycheck. And you know, we're all being deceived, and nobody's standing up for the truth. This man, I mean, I'm not trying to give Tom any praise. I have absolute empathy and sympathy for Tom. Yet six years ago, he's talking about this stuff. I didn't even know about it. I've never heard one person ever tell me about what happened in April 16, 2008. This is ridiculous. This is unforgivable. This is absolutely unforgivable to all of us. I don't care what, where what you? you're at, how much you know, what you get. Now that you know the truth, this is you are responsible to share this message to people. If you can't do it like Tom Fress can, then download this and have them listen to it. You know, most of us can't do it. Most of us are so dumbed down, including myself, and don't have a clue what the heck's going on, that we do need to be humble enough to listen to someone like a Tom Fress for once and actually start listening to this man. You know what I mean? I mean, what the heck has happened to us? I am so embarrassed to be a Christian, to be American, to be a human being, because the people just don't pay attention to the truth. This is devastating news to me, and nobody has... I don't know what to say, Tom. I'm sorry to be real emotional about this, but every time you seem to get on, <laughs> on the show, uh, especially the late at night, you know, these shows we get, I mean, I, this wakes me up, and it just... You know, I have been devastated. I've been walking around like a zombie all day long, because finally hearing about the truth of this message yesterday puts the nail on the coffin. There's no more arguments. There's no more debates. There's no more playing around. Well, maybe the Antichrist is King Charles or it's some guy in Europe or it's one of some, you know, guy in Islam or some Chinese. You know, there's no more arguments, no more debates, no more nothing. You're going to play games, you play games, but you know what? You're responsible for it. And it's going to condemn you, and you think God's not going to pay attention to that? You think he's going to just think lightly about this? Say, oh, well, at least he believed in Jesus. Do you really believe? Do I really believe? We're not even willing to stand up for the freaking truth. How much do we actually believe anything? I mean, I, I am just, I don't want to say thank you, Tom. And well, you're I, welcome. Yeah. I want to uh, before we close the show. I want I want to re- remind the listeners what uh, just occurred to me. Uh, Walt Stickle has a web page on this too. If Walt will put up the link uh, to that web page, you can uh, get listeners to go to that and see the information that he uploaded about this as well. He became interested in 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 what John Daniel and I were doing. And uh, he's more capable with a computer than I am. As a matter of fact, most of the vi- the videos and images that are on this web page of mine, Walt put up because I didn't know how to do it and still don't know how to do it. But Walt Walt has more time to do his own web page, and he's probably got a better web page on this information than I do. My understanding is he even included some of the text of the speeches that were made by Roman Catholic prelates and uh, even the Pope during his visit, which are full of innuendo, Roman innuendo. And uh, the listeners can can read all the, the, the information that Walt has. And I'm sure, uh, I don't know the website address, but I'll bet you... Uh, I'm here, Tom. Uh, yeah, I'll bet you uh, 
John Daniel has a web page too. I'm, I don't know. I've never been to it or anything. I don't remember being to it anyway. But but before we close, just look up on Wikipedia uh, Protestantism. Read it yourself. Protestantism. Look up Jesuits and read that. Look up the refer- the Protestant Reformation. Look up the the Counter Reformation. And uh, I'm I'm sure the people who are have of open minds and willing hearts, and who really love Jesus, who want to know who Christ's counterfeit is in the world and what power He has over the kings of the earth, will take that information to heart. And uh, by all means, when the Antichrist of Rome, Pope Francis I, the first admitted Jesuit pope, now we've had many popes that were Jesuit trained, one of which was Pope Pius IX, who wrote the Encyclical and Syllabus of Error of 1864, which condemned our Constitution. You know, you, you wonder why George W. Bush referred to our Constitution in private company, he referred to it as just a GD piece of paper? Well, because that's what uh, Pope Pius IX essentially called it in the Syllabus of Error. And it denies, in in that Syllabus of Error, we're denied the right of free speech, we're denied uh, the right of freedom of conscience, we're denied... uh, uh, that the government, that the the only legitimate government in the world is a papal government, and that governments of, by, and for the people is an is an attack against the uh, the legitimate throne of Christ on the earth, the papacy. And the papacy, through Pope Pius IX, who was the first uh, officially infallible pope of eight, uh, you know, First Vatican Councils, 1870, declared Pope Pius IX to be infallible. He was the one who said that governments, all governments, whether the United States or France or Italy or any of the Protestant nations of, of Europe, he said all governments up by and for the people are a violation of the divine right of the Pope to rule the world. And you have no right to choose your own religion. You have not the right to choose what you will believe. And uh, it was it was Pope Pius IX who officially damned the Constitution and Bill of Rights of the United States. And that's why Papist George W. Bush said the same thing. It's just a GD piece of paper. And which God damned the Constitution. George Bush's God, Pope Pius IX. Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, who he officially recognized as God on an interview he did with Raymond Arroyo on World Over Live. Raymond Arroyo asked him in a live interview, he says, Mr. President, you said when you looked into to Vladimir Putin's eyes, you saw his soul. I asked you, Mr. President, when you look into Pope Benedict's eyes, what do you see? And immediately, George W. Bush said plainly, God. Mr. President, what do you see when you look into Pope Benedict XVI's eyes? God. That's what he said. And he put that into action on the White House lawn in 2008. He meant what he said, and he said what he meant. Not to mention what he called us. Do you remember what he called the you know, the group of people when they were having some kind of, uh, uh, I don't know if it was a protest or some kind of rally or whatever it was? I don't know. He called a, a blankety-blank, you know, st- stupid blankety-blank. I don't even want to say it on air, but it was, he, he pretty much mocked everyone and called, you know, a bunch of idiots and yeah. Dairy errors and, and, and that um, he had no no clue what's going on. And you know what? He was right. We didn't have a clue. Yeah. And you know what? In some way, we I don't blame him. In some way, he I don't. Know, he knows how ignorant the American people are. That's why he got by with what he did in 2008, April of 2008. He got by with all of it because 
the American people are just as ignorant as he claims. Well, so, I'm not ignorant anymore, and I think Walt had something to say. Yes, I got a comment. I, I think I, it's it's not. Uh, I don't think we should cover it now. I think, it, but this is another broadcast. I think Tom, uh, if you would read the speech that Cardinal George gave to Benedict, and then make the comments. I got it, and then then read the speech that Benedict. Uh, responded to George, Cardinal George, uh, it's breathtaking. I mean, I, I my, my sentiments are the same as Michael. You know, Michael, when I heard her six years ago, I was just, I was, I was really green. But I, I knew the significance of it. But six years later, and somebody, and this is what fellowship's about when you share this with somebody, it takes your breath away. Because what we talked about tonight is history. It's history. It's it's documented history. And uh, uh, and my my sentiments also is to is to download this and spread this. I mean, you know, this should be on every alternative news rate broadcast. The Americans need to know who's running their country. We are not running down. We're not. We don't have hate and animosity in our in our voice, but the American people deserve to know who has taken over their country. And my website is at GrandDesignExposed.com. And all you have to do is put in Grand Design Exposed in any Google search engine, and it goes right to my website. And I have all the. Uh, Tom mentioned the carols. I have a. A link up there. I have uh, some, something like 40 different buttons on the left. One of the buttons is the Catholic Founding Fathers. Now, I didn't name that button. That button is named as an article that comes right off of a Roman Catholic educational site, and it's called the Catholic Founding Fathers. And these, I had a discussion with a man at called me today and uh, it, it was uh, it was fruitful because in other words I, I I've learned not to argue in other words you ask somebody have you ever heard of the carols all you have to do is put in Charles Carroll Carroll spelled C-A-R-R-O-L-L Daniel and John and you'll get all the reading material you want to read and the truth of it is, we had three Catholic founding fathers that flew under the radar, and that is actually that is the actual terminology that's used in the Catholic founding fathers. That they flew under the radar. They had to. They had because the colonies were Protestant. And if they knew that there was so much influence in the formation of our federal government by Roman Catholic Carol, by the Roman Catholic Carroll family, there'd have been a religious war of annihilation that took place even before the Revolutionary War. I'll be back in about five minutes. You know, and I want to say something else. You know, uh, Tom has read a lot of books the last eight years. He's read book after book after book. But anybody that's listening to this broadcast, research everything that was said here. This this was a a documentation on the Pope's visit in April 16th to the 20th in the United States in 2008, and it went completely unnoticed. I asked the I, I mean, you, you can just ask your neighbors about this visit. Nobody knows anything about it or the significance of it. You will not know any significance if you don't crack the books and do some research and understand who the Carols are and understand the Protest, what, what a Protestant, what it really means. It means like when the Pope's coming over here the next fall, we have the biblical, the biblical Antichrist coming to speak in our, our, 
our in the in our legislative. The biblical Antichrist. Now, this not might mean too much to somebody in the secular world, but anybody that's cracked that Bible, you've got to open it up again. This is real. There's nothing to debate here. And when you read the speech that Cardinal George introducing Benedict, and, and that's up there on my site, it's called the Pope's Speeches in 2008, both the speech that Cardinal George gave to Benedict and Benedict's response. You know, my sentiments are yours, and I, I knew about this for six years, uh, Michael, and that's why sometimes I, 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 get, a little, I get a little short, <laughs> you know, but I learned today I learned today, when you're talk, when you want to talk about some of this stuff, you have got to start at the ground level. If somebody doesn't know anything about the carols, they do not know anything about the American Revolution. What we heard about the American Revolution is, is Disneyland. Once upon a time. Once upon a time, there was a president called George Washington. And he had, he had a bunch of a little fairies, Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin. But one thing they don't teach you, they don't teach you, and this, what I'm about to say, is very instrumental. It isn't what they've told us. It's what they've left out. Because those three Catholic founding fathers were very, very instrumental in the founding of America. And all three of them, now now John Carroll had 26 years of Jesuit education, and he was a card-carrying Jesuit. Now Charles, his cousin, and Daniel, his brother, they were not Jesuits, but they had 12 to 14 years at a Jesuit university in France a Jesuit school. We had three founding fathers that were Jesuits. That is not my opinion. That can be documented. And when you understand what I just said, it should put chills on anybody's back. So that's my comment. I just want to remind the listeners that the whole purpose for my appearance tonight on your program was to show the importance of keeping a close eye on Francis the first visit to this country next fall. We've seen what Benedict the sixteenth did in two thousand and eight. What can we expect from this Jesuit pope? You can bet I'm going to be watching carefully. And I think all eyes should be on deck this time around. 